this afternoon, next floor, and is the oldest working electronic computer in the world. Um, and it was a restoration done by the CCS. By the CCS. Um, we have planned a birthday party. Um, I have it was going to be held before Christmas last year because that was when the anniversary is and was. Uh, but because of various problems with the Pegasus, we postponed it until now. Um, I mean, I, I had in mind the other birthday party, we're all going to sing happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as you know, the whole thing is not well and had a fire last July and is still not restored to health. Indeed, it hasn't been run since then. Uh, we are confident that we are hopeful that this will get back on the air sometime. But there's a lot of work to do on it uh, to follow the science museum and the procedure. Uh, so sadly, it's not a birthday party. Uh, we can't go to anybody with it because it's closed. Uh, we seem to be fated with this. Um, but I don't think it's a wake either, because I'm an optimist. I think Len, Len thinks it's a wake with the um, But it's, it is unfortunate. Uh, main speaker today is Chris Burton. He needs very little introduction around here. Um, he will also be supported by Len Hewitt and Ron Sway. Um, Chris has been in the CCS ever since it was founded in 1989. And look at the briefing here, I now realize why the CCS was founded. Because he retired at the same time. He had to have, had to have something to do. And of course, I've done, he has done a lot in the CCS ever since then. Just the Pegasus, then the Pegasus team, but also maybe Manchester, he's currently chairman of our n one working party, and so on and so on. So I'm looking forward to hearing the gospel of Pegasus this year.
so that although it sounds a mess, I mean, as it were, continuously overlay the program, it was very effective and the machine worked uh, at high speed from its internal storage. <coughs> the instruction set and the register architecture, the, the, essentially the, the architecture of the machine, uh, was largely due to Christopher Strachey, but together with um, the a very clever team that were set up to uh, de develop this system, uh, led by Bernard, uh, it had other notable people um, working in London to design develop the machine. Instruction format um, is quite simple. Seven bit operand address. Not very much, but you see it only had to address the uh, internal store, the high speed store. The six bit function code and then uh, register address modified address. It's interesting that Gordon Bell's book on computer architectures, written quite a long time ago, actually 25 years ago, uh, perhaps 30, uh, does ca characterize the Pegasus as being really the benchmark for a good internal design of the instruction set and register architecture. And, and that all was designed to make it easy for programmers to use the machine. And bear in mind, back in the 1950s, by and large, people uh, programmed in machine code. Um, and so to make the instruction set and so on easy to understand and master, uh, made it easier for programmers to use the machine. So that's really what Pegasus is on in a nutshell. Uh, of course, paper data can put out was Pegasus 2 had other uh, peripherals and so on, but we don't need to consider that at the moment. The prototype machine was developed at 56 Portman Place in London, I think I'm right there. Um, and there is the prototype in the upstairs library um, of Portman Place. Uh, that shows Arthur Jackson in the background. I mean, I think it's Peter Holland, isn't it? Oh, is that you? Uh, I don't know who you are too. Um, and that's a typical uh, view of the machine with the electronic cabinets, the plug-in cabinets, <coughs> The tape readers for input data and programs, and the tape punch and teleprinter <coughs> on the um, right hand side. And for the machine you know, between 1952. So it was a production machine. They were put into production <coughs> in West Orton and uh, delivered to customers. Mostly into science and engineering uh, situations, uh, but there were plenty of banks and insurers for the latter series of machines. Now, now let's consider the Pegasus in the Sun's version, number 25, which has a, had a long life, 50 years and a bit. Uh, it was built in 1959, as you can see, at the top here, and was delivered to Sweden to Ferranti's agent in Sweden, Aaron Ericsson's, who were going to put some modifications and, and additions onto the machine, a particular bunch of cards, I think, and other peripherals, in order to deliver it to their customer, Scandia Insurance Company in Stockholm, um, for doing insurance work. <coughs> Unfortunately, these modifications and so on didn't really work, and Scandia rejected the machine and sent it back to Ellen Ericsson's. Ellen Ericsson couldn't do anything with it, and they returned it to Westport. So it had a short holiday in Stockholm, <laughs> Uh, and then came back to West Autumn with modification to it, um, and there it languished on the uh, commissioning floor, um, where it was used, I mean, it was a second-hand machine, essentially, but it was used for testing peripherals and helping to uh, do sort of work out, work on jobs, checking things out to add to the machines, which are the new machines being created on the production line. And so, it languished there until 1963. And I'm not quite sure of the details here, but uh, at, at that point, it was handed over to University College London for doing work. And I don't know what the financial situation was, whether money changed hands or whether it was a donation. But essentially, it came from West Orton from Manchester to London, to University College London, and there it <coughs> resided in a basement, and it was used for crystallographic analysis. 
And essentially, it did that for 20 years. It was sufficiently reliable. It was maintained. Someone came in and maintained it occasionally. It was sufficiently reliable that they could load it up with data in the morning, leave it running all morning, and go in at lunchtime and see the results on the chat on tape. And, and it was doing crystallographic analysis um, from X-ray data and so on. And did that very happily in gamma basement for 20 years. Um, but at the end of that time, someone must have noticed that there were big electricity bills. <laughs> and, uh, and it was decided that really it wasn't good value for money uh, and it had to go. Uh, it was offered to the Science Museum, and my understanding was that at that time there was no room for it. <coughs> and uh, it was offered to the Computer Museum in Boston, in the States, who said they would take it. But David Dace, the director then of, of the West Orton, part of ICL, uh, said, oh, my dear bother, we're not having a machine by here in Manchester, going to the States in those circumstances. And uh, essentially, it became the property of, of the Science Museum, but located at West Thornton. And uh, we set it up at West Thornton uh, so that it was a kind of museum piece in the factory where it was born. And there it stayed for 18 years. Um, until he came back to the museum and the rest of the story, part of which you'll hear from that view. Now I want to just focus on that part uh, with um, some, some outline of what happened. So it was in West Orton until <coughs> 1987, but the property of the Science Museum. And it was maintained and displayed there uh, until 1988. Uh, when, unfortunately, the people, the new management at West Orton said, we've got really room for this old monster, send it back to the Science Museum. And it was put into storage in a storage facility in Hayes in Middlesex. And there it languished for two years. Now, what I hope you're seeing at this point is a history of a machine which is one of the first portable computers. <laughs> 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 it really is moving to places where the system is being assembled made to work, dismantled, put into store, brought out again. <coughs> so now the, science, the Computer Conservation Society was formed in 1989 and the first task was to resurrect the uh, Pegasus, get it out of storage into the so-called old canteen, uh, which is now on the site where the iron axis is, uh, and there with the Computer Conservation Society got it working, had open days, and so on. Until it got to the point where the science community said, we can't have this old computer in the old canteen, we're going to knock it down, you'll have to move it. So it moved yet again into the Blythe Road store in West Kensington, uh, which is the overflow store for the Science Museum, and there it was really put in store, but was kept going uh, until it came into the computer gallery in 2001, and uh, from there it's it now on display. So it really is a peripatetic machine, it's been everywhere. Um, going back to 1959-63, the five years when it was made in West Gorton, shipped to Stockholm and brought back, um, there's a shot of the commissioning floor at West Gorton. You can see it's rank on seri rank of Pegasus is being made. I don't know whether one of those is number 25, um, but uh, it, was, uh, it was quite impressive to see these things being built uh, <coughs> and assembled here on the commissioning floor and made to work. Uh, the three gentlemen on the right hand side gazing at it are uh, uh, production men and inspectors, and they don't really know anything about it. They're just told to build the big things uh, with uh, lavender painted, uh, uh, Valentine's special lavender number two painted panels, lovingly rubbed down between each coat, made at the Park Royal uh, Coach Works. <laughs> I'm going to jump now because I don't know really anything about what happened at the University of College London until the end of the top journey there, uh, when there was a farewell party to say goodbye to it. Les Manders uh, is the gentleman who was a freelance Pegasus maintenance engineer. And over, over the years that he was in UCL, uh, he would come in every month or periodically and have a look at the machine, keep it, make sure it was in working order, and repair it if, if necessary. Sadly, Les has died, uh, but he kept that machine going at UCL for 20 years. Colin Merton um, is, uh, is 
associated with the shooting in the early days of MRDC and his program were implementing. No doubt he's looking at the engineers uh, to see why Paris is doing it. It then left the University of Columbia, and you can see it coming out of the basement there, yeah. um, and uh, being put on the lorry to ship it back to West Wharton. Um, and here it arrives in West Wharton. Um, those who uh, may recall, that's the big tower block there, and on the right hand side is the research and development block with the uh, computer groups, and here's the machine being taken out and brought into ICL. And here the machine is what, uh, 24, 25 years old. It's halfway through its life. Uh, and we built a little room in the big computer hall of West Westporton. Uh, it styled hopefully in 1950s style with these open fluorescent lights and cream paint and so on. And um, got the machine working there again. Um, and it was it was a time when we were involved with making computers with integrated circuits at very large scale and so on. So to get back to this serious engineering was quite fun. Uh, because, as you see, a lot of valves require a lot of power, 15 kilowatts of three phase power, a great big motor alternator for driving the door. Heat from all that sent out via a refrigeration system through pipes to the outside world, and heavy cable to join the door. So when he came back to West Gordon in 1983, engineers who were used to delicately feeling about with small um, uh, printed circuit boards were faced with some serious engineering. <laughs> uh, there's the motor on that actually isn't a West Gordon, you can see that. <coughs> um, and there is the high voltage power supplies and on top of that's being chopped off as the engineers. Again, um, from pre-war, <coughs> television transmitter technology. And we got it working again and in 1984 had a welcome party. And here's our Judith Village in the front here, who was responsible for using the machine when it was at University College. And uh, <coughs> Jerry Village sat next to her. And then you may recognize some of the other faces in the back. So quite a good uh, party we had to welcome the machine back. And took the opportunity <coughs> to be a publicizing for West Gorton um, that after 25 years, this, this machine which was made on the site comes back to its home and uh, is it, um, visible again. Mainly it was uh, my colleague <coughs> and I who maintained it, because we, had, we were actually employed with real jobs. So we had to do this in spare time uh, to maintain it. And we might get a telephone call, so we've got a very important visitor coming to look at the machine, can you switch it on? So I have to apply to my manager and say, can I a couple of hours off? And of course, no one would be. It was fun working in those days. Uh, we agreed that we would go over the switching on. And uh, in the time that we were running in those three years, we switched on 50 times, jumping up to 10 hours, visiting, uh, demonstrating to vis visitors and so on. Um, and we got a bit of publicity out of it. And there is your speaker uh, under the label Hold. <laughs> And there's Ali from the uh, Titan Pool, from the Lake of View, and we were comparing uh, the great big old juggernaut with this modern new family of tiny um, computer, uh, 286, I think, or something like that. Something very, very, a very simple early PC that uh, ICL was selling. And uh, we were able to compare speeds and so on. PC usually well. Um, this was a good day, uh, 1987. Shortly before we um, switched it off to send it back to the Science Museum, and this is a scribbled note in the log book by me, uh, that at quarter to two, attempted to switch on for the check, Maria a visit of a Mr. Doran Swade from the Science Museum. <laughs> I've met him before. Um, and the, uh, and the, he, we wanted to see it working. <coughs> and, um, and he said that he just tripped out his on so, But I think we must have got it working eventually, and Doran will show how the machine and uh, could see what was going to come back to me. Um, as I said, in 1989, the computer conservation society was getting off the ground. The first the Pegasus working party was led by the late John Cooper. And uh, we, we assembled the machine in the old canteen here on the site of the site. Um, and uh, an important point at this stage was that we 
volunteers in the Food Conservation Society were being indoctrinated on the way museums work with curatorial practices. Now, if, if we engineers had just been let loose on making this machine work, then that's what we would have done. We would have gone and made it work so we could get paid on that on Friday. But you see, that isn't the, the curatorial right way to do it. What you do is make sure you put it right and get it working without damaging its authenticity, its integrity. And so we all had a lot to learn about how in extreme issue where white gloves are handling objects, you don't do anything which is going to mislead the scholar in the future about the kind of materials which you use on the machine because you have to replace the wire with a like coated wire or something like that. Um, and, and generally how to behave with respect to these objects which are held, which are held on trust for the nation, essentially. They're, they're not our objects, they belong to the nation forever. Uh, so that was a very interesting time when we were all learning uh, how, how, how these things were done. And I think at the same time the Science Museum was learning about how volunteers could be used, volunteers with expertise on these objects, uh, but who, uh, and, and knew, you know, anything was to know about the object, uh, but ha had to be um, inculcated in, in ways of work, working together. Um, so it took 12 months of careful reassembly and recommission, cleaning, and uh, so on, and uh, getting the machine going. And John's legacy, actually, is this successful synergy that we have now between volunteers and the museum. So it's not only here at the Science Museum, but in the Science Museum as well. Good, good rapport between volunteers with the expertise and uh, the, the um, Science Museums with the responsibility. Now, um, here is the machine in the old canteen, and I won't dwell on this because uh, then we'll be saying more about it. Um, and in 1996, we were on the move again, uh, the old <coughs> canteen was being demolished. And I think that last sentence uh, we will always remember, that when this was po proposed that we move the machine again, we all sort of said, oh, no, not again. And Tony, said, Tony Sales said, we can't guarantee that we'll be able to keep it working. Every time we move it, dismantle it, reassemble it again, it's inevitable that things break. And so we had to say that you know, the more this machine moves about, the less chance that it will work. But um, then we'll be able to take it away. Um, now, at this point, what I'd like to do is show the old Pegasus film, which many of you, I think, will have seen. An eight minute film made in 1955. Um, and uh, essentially a sales uh, film called the Pegasus, which you will gather, I think, looking at the film, probably barely existed at the time the film was made. So I'll see whether we can get that. This. The project for the control of tuberculosis using mass radiography required the development of a quite new type of camera lens. Working at an aperture of f0.7, this has 16 separate curved surfaces involving eight glasses, each of which has two distinct characteristics. This gives 47 variables altogether. It needed all this paperwork to compute this lens, 
and required three years of laborious calculation by the designer and his two assistants. A calculation which could now be performed in a matter of weeks with Pegasus. <laughs> the Muslim Leadership Survey yields 13,000 new questionnaires every year. The resulting information is published as 32 complex tables. At present, it takes six weeks to prepare them. Pegasus will do it in a few days. The speeding up of calculations made possible by Pegasus can save lives. The complicated stability calculations for each new type of aircraft can now be completed before the test pilot is asked to take the plane up for the first time. The facility of computers for storing and quickly representing great quantities of information opens up totally new fields. For example, air traffic control or weather forecasting. Information can be processed so quickly that useful predictions can be made before the weather has actually changed. <laughs> when an electric cable is being erected, it must be pulled tight enough not to sag too much in summer, yet not so tight that it breaks in winter. The foreman on the site uses a family of curves like this. They are derived from formulae of this nature. To solve these equations, the programmer prepares a list of instructions to the computer in a form acceptable to it. Initially, these are written down like this. They must now be transcribed with a tape perforating machine. This transposes the characters onto tape. These punched holes can represent either instructions or numbers. In practice, a second tape is always punched by another operator and the two tapes can then automatically be compared to eliminate human errors. All this equipment can be housed apart from the computer proper, which looks like this model. <coughs> On the right at the back, the power supply cabin. To the left of it, the computer itself with a control desk in front. At the bottom of the screen on the right is the output teleprinter, and behind it, the output punch. In the center, the control panel and monitor tube and on the left, the high-speed input reader. First, the program is fed into the computer to prepare it for a calculation. The program tape is placed in the input tape reader, and the operator checks all the equipment to make sure it is ready. Now we can start. This makes the machine read in the program of instructions and the numerical data to be worked on. You can see how fast Pegasus is taking in the program by the speed at which the tape is pouring through. This tape reader runs at 200 numbers a second. These holes in the tape are converted into electrical impulses. They come up on the monitor tube like this. Let's stop it and look at one word. These impulses are now being operated in the computer. This is made up of a large number of basic units. They plug in and out quite readily for servicing. The socket it plugs into looks like this. These sockets are all interconnected at the back. They are color-coded to make sure that they are put in the right place. These packages are mainly of five basic types, all assembled on identical blanks. These four are manipulating circuits. And this is the fast storage unit. The construction has components on one side, and soldering connections on the other. This system allows for dip soldering and for printed circuits. In this fast storage unit, the succession of signals of pulse no pulse are injected from this coil down a nickel delay line inside this sleeve. They travel along the nickel line and are picked up by this coil. 
At the start, the signal has this shape. After passing along the line, it has become deformed. In this form, it is accepted by the pickup bell and amplified, passed to the middle bell and reshaped, and then passed back to the driving bell again where it is re-injected to the line. In this way, the word can be stored until required. Then, it can be obtained every time it reaches the driving bell again. That is, 8,000 times every second. Pegasus also has a main store of very large capacity provided by this magnetic drum unit. This part is the driving motor. Under the cover is the magnetic drum itself. This is coated with red magnetic iron oxide bonded in resin. The drum rotates at 4,000 RPM. <coughs> Here is a stack of 10 re-drive heads. They are fixed close to, but not touching, the surface of the drum. Here is just one single head taken out of a stack. It records the pulse, no pulse signals, and also reads them back again when required. The working gap at the top is only a thousandth of an inch wide. When the calculation has been completed, the results are fed out and punched onto paper tape. To make it possible to read the answers, the tape moves on to this unit, which senses the holes and operates the teleprinter. The punch card machine can be used as an alternative. This accepts the results more quickly. Fastest of all is the magnetic tape unit. Now to return to our original calculation, sag and tension in overhead cables. The results began to come out within a minute of starting the calculation. Pegasus is completely automatic. It can be programmed to give a signal when it has completed any stages of its operation. offers to scientists and designers a practical new tool for their work, a tool which offers opportunities of opening up entirely new fields of endeavor and investigation. A triumph that's lasted 50 years. <laughs> <coughs>
the Mafia Force in 1953. I joined Mark Kirby installing radar on rotor sites. And that was a wonderful job. At that. It, uh, and I was away from home all the time, playing extremely well. Um, people like my company on cost plus 10% in those days. That was great. Um, and then in 55, I, I had a young son, and uh, my wife wanted to be home, so I joined Ferranti as a computer maintenance engineer. And I worked on uh, the uh, Mark 1 Star. Uh, commissioning it at Chenmel, maybe around uh, Chanter. In actual fact, I just realised this. Uh, that's, that's me commissioning uh, with Bill Wallace, who's the one of the commissioning engineers on the Mark <coughs> And that's uh, Ron Sinjin, who was a, also a, an engineer at Ferrantis, who uh, stayed on the bottom of the road, and he stayed there for two years. Um, after two years, I went to work for, I learned that uh, ICI was by by Pegasus, and I um, went on to um, join ICI. <coughs> uh, that Pegasus was slightly different than uh, any of the previous ones because it was basically the forerunner of the commercial Pegasus. Uh, it had a three phase standard Pegasus system uh, with a separate magnetic tape bed. Five porous tape units, one of which on a separate three bay converter with hard of carbine and cloud punch, light pitch, etc. And one tape unit was switched between the converter and the, uh, and, and the computer, and you were able to uh, load the data on punch cards, which uh, I say I've got it all going to be using for donkey's years, so I love this in punch cards. All my sales forecasting were done on the punch cards. All my accounts were done on the punch cards. So uh, uh, you then fed the, uh, put that tape on the, uh, on the Pegasus, and you went to sort and organize with all the things that you would do. Um, uh, system ran for 12 years. It's about 3,000 hours a year, 40,000 hours. And I'll turn that 98 percent <coughs> Uh, we never had to replace a fuse in the power supply, only the case for bubble. Most often they were falsers in this machine and the museum machine, which you can call it, were extremely reliable and, and nobody could say, you know, that they, they weren't because they were control. I had 32 years experience with Pegasus and they've always been extremely reliable. The museum Pegasus, uh, we've run it for approximately 150 hours a year in the last 10 years. And until the July, July fire in the PSU, the only major problems were the air conditioning system and the ISS supply and the three flex of glass line to the computer. Um, I joined the uh, Pegasus working, I retired in 1990 uh, for formal. Right, the time completely, that's in the classroom, it's going to be the time completely. Uh, got, um, you know what to do, so uh, I, I found the Conservation Society, joined it, and uh, joined John Cooper, and uh, uh, I've been there ever since. Uh, I just want to know what to see what I want to. That's, that's the, the, the museum in the Pegasus uh, in the old canteen uh, in 1993. It was a slightly different uh, That's John Cooper, who was a great guy to work for. And uh, the way I saw him, very, very well. In fact, I think we all worked together extremely well. Tony, Chris, Peter, John, David. Um, you know, so it was a, a great team. The only problem is we didn't meet that frequently, but uh, when we did meet, we, we enjoyed what we were doing. Um, right. That's one of uh, Chris Hawker, who is uh, David Mitchell, who I've been saying, the senior photograph David. Uh, I don't know who this guy is on the right here, do you, Chris? Uh, it's not me, I'm sure. Uh, 
questions? Uh, one, one, uh, John Cooper passed away very uh, young, possibly. Uh, Crystal Culver was the chairman. And uh, uh, the one thing I cannot remember very much about was this special room. <laughs> I, don't, I don't recall that at all. I don't think it's going from my memory. Mm. Not because it's all the same thing as there. Built round machines to protect it while they were trying to knock it on the past of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, then we were prepared to go to, uh, uh, to, to fly through. Uh, as Tony said, when are we ever getting going again? Uh, yeah, who knew? But what I will say is, when uh, I was not there when they prepared it for, I think I was off in America. Uh, I was not there when they prepared it to go to fly uh, through. But what I will say is the way they prepared it to go to fly through was what's wonderful. It made reassembling it to fly through uh, very simple indeed. I'll show you what I mean. Um, because uh, in the old canteen, the, the Pegasus hadn't been, it wasn't on a false floor like many of the Pegasus were that were installed in this room. It, it was connected by an overhead set of cables. And what Tony and Chris did, which was so simple, I would have referred to it, what they did was they cut the cables on the diagonal. This one, this one, this one in pairs. And all we had to do was join up the chocolate box, you know, with the connect box. And, and we had it working okay, it took some time for the uh, uh, for the museum people to put in the free face supply and uh, on but uh, we had it working very, very quickly. Very quickly. So uh, that was thanks to the way it was uh, uh, dismantled and shipped. Okay. Uh, there's uh, Derek Millage, uh, Martin Wingset, who's back to us, Peter, and uh, Doug uh, Brewster. Yeah. Um, and uh, we we went down and got it down just for weeks. Ran the machine up, got it working. And what 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 we did at that time was we couldn't demonstrate it to people unless there were occasional demonstrations of special visitors to the science museum. And what what we tended to do was try and make it work better. And what one of the things we did was uh, Martin. And uh, Derek did a, a lot of this. I did some of it too. Uh, uh, we, uh, one of the things we did was, was to use the margins control to uh, reduce the HT voltages and check for faulty packages and valves and stuff like that. So we made the machine even more reliable than it was when it was at. Uh, when he was in the old canteen. And that stood us in good stead for, for, for um, when we did move it. That was uh, the BBC came, I don't know who this guy is here, but he was one of the presenters. He came to make a, a, a film of, uh, of, of the machine in 1999. I don't know what it was about, and I don't think I ever saw it, but I don't know who was here. That's Derek and uh, Martin. Looking at packages and watching the console. Um, that's that's one of my favorites. Okay, uh, in 1999 we uh, we had to uh, move it, and what happened was uh, we got the uh, instructions that it was going to be installed in the second floor of the science museum. And um, what happened was the, uh, the museum uh, uh, got hold of the uh, foreman's, the contractors, to actually supervise it as uh, none of the people who worked on the machine were uh, able to take responsibility for its movement. Uh, you know, we, because we weren't working anymore, we, we had a company behind us, they had to have some. So foreman's took the job. 
叫我们呃呃呃怎么 manage in a little bit of your time, but、uh, myself and Chris and Peter、uh, did all the work preparing the drawings, the wiring diagrams, all that kind of thing. And in actual fact, we supervised the engineers on site in the museum who did the wiring,、uh, and we actually did. Sorry, no, no, no.、Uh, we actually、uh, did the final connection to the terminal box, Peter and myself and, and, and the other people, because、uh, that way we knew it was、um, you know, it was correct. We hadn't just relied on the old. And in actual fact, although we, I think we had one. Minor wiring mistake.、Uh, in general, it's、uh, it's not very much.、Uh, I、uh, I had to leave in December. I delayed my trip to、uh, America far too long, and、uh, uh, I left it. And, and Tony and,、uh, and Chris, I think, completed it.、Um, the museum were very kind. They uh, uh, all they paid for the performance of. Fortunately, that guy was on some about three hundred pounds a day or something. I don't know if I looked at. They did actually pay us,、uh, the working party,、uh, for the work they'd done in moving it into the museum and、um, the working party, and we contributed that to to the CCS.、Yeah.
simple things like um, birthday from day birth. You know, it doesn't take long to do. Just tell them what day they're born. Or factorization of different numbers. We also run uh, music programs and stuff like that. But uh, things of uh, uh, just quite free stuff. That's a bit, too, a bit too much. It takes too long to come. Now, the, the other thing, uh, the one thing I wanted to say was about the reliability of the machine. Our normal practice there was I'd get there at 10 30, Peter would be there by then. And normally we would just switch the motor alternator set up. Uh, the motor alternator set and start up, we walk up to the machine, press the heaters on button. It takes two, two minutes for the heaters to run up, put the HD on, and within five minutes of us starting up, the machine will be running. And okay, we may have the online given under a problem we have to point out, should it back in again with a little bit of contact, or we, we may have to adjust it again or something like that, and make online. But in general, within five minutes of the starting the machine up, it was running. And it was like that. Every time, it was not just occasionally, it was every time. It was, it was so reliable, it, it, you know, just incredible. incredible. Um, we had occasionally to uh, repair packages, uh, nickel lines, obviously, uh, there was a limited number of them, we had to have them repaired. Um, Chris built a, uh, uh, a device at home to repair nickel lines. Um, and we used to send them up to, to him, although he wasn't officially allowed by the museum. Left the museum, but you know, we had to look at some of them. Certainly, as far as the, uh, uh, if we had a problem with uh, a drum package where there's lots of crystal and switching, uh, then there was no way we could repair that in the museum, or there wasn't the facilities there. So I used to send them the briefcase taken on and repair it at home and all the work for that. So the scopes and tools and everything else. So, but, uh, you know, um, that helped with these ones too. Um, other, other minor problems we had, we had problems with things like the more, the more difficult in the Pegasus is the machine itself has stood up to time extremely well. The most ultimate to set. Uh, the last time I looked at it, which was 2000, yeah, 2000, 1999, 2000. Um, the, the, there was nowhere at all on the brushes or the slippery. They were just as good as they were 50 years ago. Um, uh, the the um, equipment inside the, the PSU itself also uh, they were very, very soft. You know, you know, all the contacts and stuff like that didn't really give any trouble. Uh, the only thing we had trouble with uh, uh, when we moved it was the Start out to start, and that was basically my fault. I, I mistakenly let it um, be trans transported horizontally. And as it had dash pots in with oil in, the oil leaked on the contacts, and eventually we had to have the, um, uh, the contacts replaced. And the, the uh, engineers of the museum made us some new contacts. We found a company to silver plate them, and we refitted them. I mean, it's been all right ever since. It's, uh, it's fine. So we, we haven't had a lot of major problems, but the areas where we do, we have had problems, are things like the tree equipment. The tree equipment is, this is 50 years old now. Um, we use the tree equipment for paper preparation, etc. And uh, one of the tree 75s died on us. Um, I managed to locate two more. And I managed to locate two pre-engineers, uh, Henry Lowell and Derek Nemsen. And they agreed to come and repair it. However, uh, there were three different punches, all identical. The three different, um, sorry, uh, uh, pre-75s were all identical as far as the labels are concerned. Uh, we only had a clutch that would fit one of them. So we fitted it to that one, and we all working only to find out it was the wrong course. And because they, they were there, you know, so there's nothing we could do about it. And to, to, uh, to rebuild it again, we couldn't do it. 
office, so uh, we were uh, stripping down two machines, and so we spent many, many hours rebuilding the infrastructure. Fortunately, we had, a, uh, we had another uh, tape editing, a piece of tape editing equipment, which consisted of a PC, uh, uh, a serial photoelectric tape reader, and a serial high speed punch, facet punch, which went to it. And, uh, and we, we, we have used those through my PC. Uh, did you write a program for this for that? John Hooper wrote it, yeah. You know how you've amended it. Uh, but uh, so that, 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 that is still working. We, uh, uh, we did have a fair bit of the trend paper tape reader. Uh, that one of the motors, one of the pubs motors failed. Uh, once again, in our best collection, we managed to find a, another trend paper tape reader. Unfortunately, that motor fell too, but I managed to persuade PAPS to PAPS UK uh, to give us two motors free of charge, which was very powerful. Although they didn't quite fit, we had some more players and everything. That was working, so. Yeah. Um, so, in general, as I said, the machine has been excellent. Some of the peripherals have you know, they got very old now, and, and we're. we're Getting a bit cautious about uh, running things like the teleprints are you know, 50 years old and it doesn't get much maintenance because there's very few people who are to maintain 50 years old teleprints. So, uh, but, but they still work, they still produce the answers we want. Uh, well, this is where we're coming up to, as I said, Pegasus on how beautifully uh, we had a, a small fire. In the past of <coughs> in July 2009. Um, and this, although the museum went into panic mode almost immediately, we had to find, uh, inside, it went, when they installed the Pegasus in the museum, uh, in the overhead ducts for the power supply on the, uh, on the, on the computer, they put uh, smoke detectors, which is very sensible, but of course what happened when first we knew there was a problem, A was the machine tricked the HD button that back, but we didn't know what had caused it, uh, and so the people from the control code room came down and said, there's a fire, there's a fire, and in actual fact there was a little boy who had been watching the demonstrations, and he told his mummy that there was a fire, he hadn't told anybody else. <laughs> He'd seen the smoke coming out of the tunnel basket. Uh, and it was rather interesting that um, when, when the people from the, the control room and some of the seats some of the management came to the Pegasus, I, 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 was, I went into the back of the power supply unit to look where the smoke had originated from. And I was standing here, and these people were standing where right at the back of the I don't know what they expected when they thought it was a blow up. Anyway, um, the, the fire was, was not uh, very serious in actual fire. Oh, I'll show you. That's, this is the area that set on fire. What, what these are, these are the large control pots which were on, on this type of Pegasus, not on the other one, but on this type were, were motorized. So you could, you could control them from the front, front panel. You reduce the minus 150, 300 to supplies. And uh, this was the wiring to, to it. This little here went to a tape lock here. You can see that as it bits of paper. So the, 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 the wires were identified. And, and, uh, and that, that was before. And that's, that's the fire. What happened? These, these uh, six. Uh, connections here are the minus 150, 200, 300 volts uh, go and return to the margin spots. And uh, uh, what happened, we believe, is that some dust and fluff collected under this area here, and that possibly was all this lot was removed when we installed the machine. In, uh, in the old canteen, and this, this, this lot was very, I don't think the margin pots were not crystal, I wasn't there. Um, the margin pots weren't working, and we 
took the whole panel out and had it uh, uh, cleaned and sorted out by the museum staff in those days. They had people who do, do that kind of thing. They don't know. And uh, they, um, uh, and it was put back. And possibly the way it was put back, there was a moment wire uh, left loose. There was not in any danger at all. You've got a lot of fluff, and we've got a bit of leakage from some of the capacities. And, and uh, so I think actually spontaneously burst into play. Of course, as soon as it did so, uh, the glass by fuses broke, uh, blew two, two fuses, and they didn't supply blue, and the HD was switched off, and that was it. The fire extinguished itself, and it was all over in about two minutes, but the repercussions are still going on. We haven't been near the machine since that day. Uh, so, well, whether we've had a will, I don't know. I say I'm a pessimist. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure uh, of what is going to happen in the future. Um, uh, I'd like to say a couple of things about uh, the people I've worked with, Derek and Peter and. Uh, Martin, Glennis, etc. Uh, uh, how much help have been to me uh, uh, over the years? I've been doing this job now since 1997. Um, and every year I've also spent the winters in America, so that's meant that a certain amount of that uh, work has, has fallen on Peter, who's always stood by me and helped uh, tremendously. Chris, again, has helped me. Uh, whenever we've had problems, Chris has always been there as a, uh, a wonderful person to talk to about a problem or discuss technical matters with. Uh, the help he's given me is, is, is countless, countless, aren't we? Um, and from the museum, in general, we've had nothing but help from people like uh, uh, Rod Smith, Rod Skidmore, uh, Tilly Blythe, Doran. Uh, all these people have been extremely helpful to us. Um, the only thing that uh, bothered me about the museum was its bureaucracy. You know, to get anything done at the museum is, it is extremely difficult, and still is, still is. But uh, on the other hand, we have had this wonderful experience of running this machine for, as I say, I, I've been associated with Pegasus so 12 years at ICI, 20 years here. That's a hell of a long time to be associated with the uh, machine. But I've enjoyed it in every minute, moment of it, and I hope, I hope it will uh, go on. Uh, looking back at the experience with Pegasus, what strikes me was its incredible reliability. The dark designers seem to use all the components of their center of the tolerance now. The slow run-up of, run of the valve heaters, for example, the life of the valves, the protection circuitry also worked extremely well in general. That well designed, well engineered machine, a credit to its makers. Uh, 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 I think that's, that's about it.
This is, this is the scenario. Here we have the cockpit of the machine. Uh, with this, with the chair here, um, is this photograph is in George Felton's book, 1961. And the chair is the very chair which is actually up on the machine inside the museum on the gallery now. It's extremely shabby, but it is an important artifact. There's <laughs> very important people in the <laughs> so the, the scenario is this, the, the pilot sits in the seat, he's got two paper tape readers, uh, one, uh, but both usable and changeable essentially, but typically a programming one and typically, let's say, library routines in the other tape reader, uh, hence the past tape rewinder, so that when you've read the library routines you wind the tape back. Uh, control the machine from the switches and the beeping of the, inside the machine with these telescopes. Uh, output on the punch of 33 characters a second. Um, the jolly old teleprinter works at 6.6 .6 characters a second. So the paper tape comes out of the punch into the uh, mechanical tape reader, uh, which feeds the teleprinter. So there's a hole in the desk <coughs> representing a buffer store. <laughs> the paper tape goes in quick and comes out slow. In, 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 in practice, extremely useful and, and simple system because typical, typically programs will send information out on a bunch of bursts. And uh, so the bursts of tape go down in the hole in the desk and then slowly jump, jump, jump steadily out on the printer. So it really is a very nice smooth data smooth. So I wanted to just remind you of that's the scenario. We're sitting at this chair. Uh, so I'm going to go to the scenario. I think I heard someone say it was a grainy photo. Now here we have the cockpit, and you can see the two tape readers here. Uh, over on the right hand side, at the top is the waste bin where we dispose of old paper tapes, and below it is the tape punch. Now, regrettably, this projector trims off the last pixels of the screen. So I can't, the, the tape is coming down here. Uh, so you'll only see a few um, holes in the tape. And at the bottom is the teleprinter, um, and in, in the cent centre of course is the control system. <coughs> uh, my hand, the photograph of my hand, is movable. Um, so uh, there are important things you can do, like you don't want to have the uh, monitor too bright, so you might want to turn it down a bit, or and certainly you want to improve the focus. So the, the control knobs can do that and switch them. Uh, character formulas uh, uh, um, order instruction form. So all the con controls by and large work with knobs to earn and so on. And select accumulator and so on. Here are all the hand switches, which we can turn on and off. And the control switches here are some neon lights. Incidentally up at the top here are lights to show that the mains is on and the alternator. I got those switched on before you came. <coughs> so the power is on this thing. And here are the lights to indicate the drum trees. Um, finally, up here is the well known little busy um, cabinet which you can draw with the tapes in. Um, and you open the drawer and get a tape out and so on. Um, and uh, the, the, all the libraries and so on. So these are very long drawers, which <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, now uh, in this machine, in the Pegasus, of course, as you all know, there is a set of initial orders on the drum. Um, so, and, and these are the orders which interpret uh, the paper tapes and the, the instructions punched on the paper tapes and load 
uh, programs into the memory and all sorts of uh, utility operations they do. Um, and many of the initial orders uh, do useful things like print the date and time and serial number, the, the date and serial number uh, on the telephone. So that when you run the program, uh, you can, um, uh, you've got a record on the telephone of what you did. Uh, and that, that particular initial order is invoked by the directive D, D for date. Uh, and if you put D on the paper tape, of course, it's a serial number. It can also be invoked by D is the fourth letter of the alphabet, so four in binary um, is D. And we can invoke the initial orders by going to start and then run on. Whereupon uh, the punch punches some tape, there is a 77 stop saying that it's halted. And if we go up to the tape reader, you can see the tape punch. You can see a bit of tape is being punched. I'm sorry you can't see the rest of the tape. And I'll press the right up. Lo and behold, it's the 17th of May 2010, and this is the 28th program we've run. So that's, that's the kind of thing the initial orders can do. Better clear this hand switch. Um, and so, Typically running a oh, notice by the way that in here in accumulator seven there's some numbers or instructions that have appeared. Uh, we won't bother about the detail of what they are. Over here are in fact the current instruction and the, the following instruction. Um, that is actually a 72, which is to do with getting data off of job book. Now what we'll do now is run a demonstration program. And this is the kind of thing that Len would be doing on the real machine. Uh, he would get out, let's say, the fast factors program, get it out, carry it in his hand, and put it in the tape reader. And you can see it's quite a small tape, there's only a little point of tape on the right hand side, um, and it pencils on the front to get that factors and then the rest of the program. So we'll ask the initial orders to load this program. So we're going to start and run. Eight, eight, eight. Eight. What next? Two, three, three, three. 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 Three
То есть вполне надо быть этому уровнем. Ну, вот это
apologize for the absence of my front tooth. Um, I don't normally walk around like this. Um, it's the result of another rugby injury that came, came back to haunt me. Um, I'll try and avoid, um, I think it's more disconcerting for you than for me, but I'll try and avoid words beginning with B. <laughs> um, the custom seems to be doing use oneself. Um, I was curated from the Union of the Science Museum for about 40 years and later assistant director of health collections. And um, in, a, in a moment of boldness in 1989, I approached the British Computer Society and proposed that we actually found a society uh, called the Computer Conservation Society and gave a presentation there. And at present, that was Tony Sale. And um, it was actually from that that, that, that the original proposal to found a society for certain computers that this whole enterprise um, started. So Pegasus has a very special relationship with the CCS because as, as both uh, Chris and uh, Len have mentioned, it was the first um, machine that the CCS undertook to restore. I was successful in actually poaching Tony from the CCS. And it's actually through Tony's efforts. He, Tony created the physical environment in the old canteen which you can hear from the way people speak about it, he's spoken about a great fondness. This was a kind of club. It was a clubhouse where people gathered. I think the closest we have to that now is at Bletchley Park. We have that same sense that these are volunteers doing what they wish to do out of their own commitment and motivation. Um, but it was Tony who actually created the physical environment for this first um, restoration, uh, both uh, logistically, organizationally, he was very active in actually negotiating the constitution of the Fondue Constellations. And one thing I knew as curator, having being, if you like, responsible for the museum for the whole enterprise, was that if Tony undertook to do it, it would get done. And it was an absolute pleasure in that way. You just didn't have to, you'd lock it in a room. Um, so uh, Pegasus is actually, this, Pegasus has a special relationship with the CCS. And I think that the fact that we're all in this room, the fact that we're here 10, 20, 21 years later, um, Pegasus to me uh, symbolizes, if you like, that the success. We had no idea whether we'd succeed. We had no idea whether we would be able to prevail upon both the institution, the BCS, and others to create the society to do what we wanted to do. So if you like, Pegasus symbolizes the, uh, the success, if dare we say it, without um, invoking the wrath of the gods, and the success of the society, and, and, and reflected now in the vigor and vitality of its programs, and the fact that here 20 years later, actually, I'm um, still, still talking about it. Um, there are other respects in which Pegasus is special to the CCS. Because it was the first undertaking for a restoration, it was through the Pegasus project that they actually pioneered the working practices and protocols by which these things are done. Uh, there are several issues involved in this. Some of them have already been mentioned. Firstly, there's the issue of accountability. The curator is responsible. In fact, when an object is acquired, the curator signs a form and says, I take responsibility for this object. Um, and he, through a, a chain of command, is responsible through his management, through the director of trustees, to the, um, the Minister for Culture and Sport, as it then was, for the integrity of that object. Now, he is within a chain of accountability within a national institution. The moment a volunteer, like working parties from the CCS, enter into the scene, there is a problem, or there is an issue, about accountability. If engineers who are not accountable in this chain of accountability are let loose on a machine, it's the curator that is responsible for any outcome. So if you like me and originally Tony and subsequently all the, the, the chairmen of the working parties, I was at the interface of how to negotiate to extend the chain of accountability from the curatorial protocols to a group of volunteers who were not um, subject to the same chains of accountability. And Chris mentioned this about, I think he mentioned the word indoctrination. I'd like to think it was slightly gentler than that. <laughs> it was really to reconcile two fundamentally different cultures. One is that of preservation, and um, if you like, passive preservation. The model for curators and conservation is archaeological. The idea is that there is a rare and scarce fragment of evidence that is lost in the mists of time, which reflects an entire culture. This, if you like, is sacrosanct. At center, the center of museum culture is the primacy of the original artifact. In the case of industrial objects, the situation is very different. There's a vast amount of information. Many of these machines are the living memory of the original pioneers and practitioners. And so there's an adaptation to two separate cultures. The engineer, who takes professional pride in being able to fix a machine regardless, use a paper clip, use a piece of string, beat the deadline to get the machine working. This, if you like, at times conflicts with the fundamental archaeological model by which curators and particularly conservators work, and that is to say, preserve at all costs the integrity of the machine. The reason for this is that at the center of this, of this uh, practice 
is an article of faith in museum culture, which says that the object, the artifact, is the ultimate evidentiary source. We do not know how these machines and artifacts will be interrogated in the future. We, the, 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 the questions that will be asked of these machines is in, definitionally and in principle unforeseeable. For example, we have a machine we wish to restore in working order. And there is cloth bound and rubber insulation which has decayed. We have a choice. Leave the machine in a non-working state or replace it with PVC. Now, it is possible that in years to come, in some unforeseeable and unforeseen way, somebody will not be researching that machine, but be researching, say, the introduction of PVC insulation in electronic equipment. To what extent would they be misled by saying an IE59 machine had PVC, assuming it was that? That's a sort of a, a trivial example. So, um, so at the center of this is not, okay, yes, we can document the various um, uh, um, uh, practices and protocols we can adopt. We can agree that this thing must be labeled in the machine. If there's any alteration by substitution that is non-contemporary, then it is labeled in the machine. We could agree that all replacement wiring is a distinctive color. Then, you know, to what extent are we jeopardizing, compromising the visual impression, the physical presentation of that machine? So these are the kinds of issues that we were forced to face, or that we faced, you know, we welcomed these issues so that we could deal with them and establish protocols and working practices. And it was Pegasus that we pioneered these things. To reconcile two cultures, the professional pride of an engineer in getting the machine to work at all costs, and the issues of what is permissible, what is tolerable, or even desirable intervention that would alter the fundamental physical integrity of the machine. And uh, I think curators um, are fairly liberal in this. I think conservators, through their training, are more conservative in this. Um, for example, I remember there was an issue when some oil spilled out of an oil full transformer and a member of the working party took a rag to clean it up. And there was hoo-ha from the conservators saying, you can't use detergents, you can't be cleaning, because, again, who knows? Somebody may be researching the use of paints in the electronic industry, not researching machines at some future time, and one could argue the chemical structure of the paint had been altered by some mm -hmm. inadvertent thing. So, these issues were not without tensions, but the beauty of it was that, that we managed to convey and to, if you like, inculcate these curatorial values into the practitioners, into the practitioners and the chairperson of the working party. And the, the chairpersons of the working party are crucial in this because they are the ones responsible for the dissemination of those things. And we were hugely, greatly fortunate having such a core, firstly, people with huge expertise, experience, receptive to these things, who adopted and absorbed and internalized these values to the extent you can now let them loose without supervision, if you like, because we know we have absolute confidence, we have absolute confidence that um, these protocols would be given because they understood the fundamental issue about um, what was permissible and tolerable intervention. Um, so, uh, so Pegasus, uh, if you like, was part of the, the arena, uh, the test bed, um, in which we pioneered these fundamental working practices. And uh, delighted to say that, that those original practitioners, Tony Chris, uh, Len, um, uh, these guys, um, have uh, gone on to, to um, you know, great things. The reconstruction to the Park, mm -hmm. Pegasus, the, uh, sorry, the uh, Manch the Baby, um, Colossus, all these other fantastic, these are remarkable projects, all grew, if you like, um, from, sorry, uh, all carried over these, the principle of what it is uh, a physical artifact is in a museum culture. And the essential of that is the notion of the artifact as evidentiary source and um, to preserve the integrity of the artifact in the light of unforeseeable inquiry. That is to say, we do not know how these machines and artifacts will be interrogated. And we're talking about archaeological timescales here, not um, the, the spans of any given lifetime. The motive for establishing the CCS at the time was we were planning a, a gallery that was on the bicentenary of Babbage's birth, that was uh, the bicentenary was to be celebrated in 1991. And um, the, the, the original, my original motive was there was this huge expertise and experience of people outside the museum world of these machines, their knowledge vastly would exceed anything possible by any given curator. And the idea was to restore to working order machines for display in the gallery. And there was a very strong motivation in the CCS that this was for purposes of display and demonstration. The idea was for the gallery in 91 to take the machines that were memorable in the computing collection and have them demonstrable on gallery. That was the original motive. And 
Pegasus on display, if you like, is a realization of those early expectations and aspirations. And so Pegasus always uh, has a particular place in, in our affections um, in the light of our original aspirations and expectations for the society as we originally conceived. They were terrific days, those. Um, you know, we were breaking new ground. There was a very strong sense of, of enthusiasm and commitment. And uh, it was, uh, how do I say this without being offensive? Health and safety wasn't a very recognized field in those days. And uh, we were actually able to do things that are highly inconceivable now. I think you sense from then a certain degree of frustration. I mean, he said he used the word bureaucracy. Um, uh, I mean, right now we, we actually operate on a kind of uh, petty tyrannies when it comes to health and safety or things that are totally nonsensical. Constraints that are entirely nonsensical. I'm not saying all of them are. I'm saying the overall motive of doing that is fine. But those days were fantastic. We were let loose in the Alcan team. The Alcan team was a single story building in the, just outside here in the, in the, in the car park. And um, we actually essentially had a free reign. As a curator, I was accountable. I was accountable to the institution. And within the brackets, an umbrella of what I said was okay. There, were absolutely, there was no other accountability. It's inconceivable for that situation. But those were highly unusual times. Um, uh, it's inconceivable that, that curators would have the kinds of freedoms that we had at that time. Okay, um, uh, restorations involve hugely high levels of commitment, of motivation, of expertise, of endurance, of persistence, um, and of enthusiasm. And um, were it not for the fact that almost the vast majority of these efforts are voluntary, that these things would be entirely unaffordable. Um, there is barely a, a, a restoration or a reconstruction in particular that does not have a set of heroic tales of ingenuity, of challenges met, of obstacles overcome. And um, if we step aside, and, and these, these, you know, we applaud, and so we should. I mean, these are remarkable efforts done through enthusiasm of people wishing to share and, ex uh, sh and share and disseminate their expertise and experience. And, uh, these act as generational bridges, if you like, um, to new generations that get an opportunity to see these. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful enterprise. But when we step back from that, we can ask, perhaps a harsh, it sounds harsh, but it is not. It, it, we can ask, what is the justification for these, for these um, efforts? What is the justification for these projects? How do we justify the historical and social utility? By utility, I mean in the economic sense of what makes a thing desirable to possess? That is economic, the economist's definition of, of, of utility. What makes it desirable to have a working machine? How do we justify the historical utility? How do we justify the social utility of these machines? In, in, in other words, if we had to convince someone hostile to the enterprise who did not share, who was not part of the charmed circle of practitioners and, and, and engineers and pioneers, how do we convince them that this is a worthwhile thing to do um, and that a museum should extend an umbrella of welcome to host efforts of this kind? And um, nobody's actually challenged me to, to um, to justify it. But I think it's a useful exercise to do, uh, both in anticipation and also to remind ourselves actually what is of value um, to history, to the community of practitioners and to museums about restoring machines at all. So really what, what I propose to reflect on is actually uh, why we do this and, and how would we justify to the outside world, people outside um, the, the computer profession, the computer profession um, as to why it is this desirable thing. Um, firstly, historical utility. What value in history is having a working machine better than a non-working machine? Yeah. Given that almost uh, the vast majority of artifacts in museums are passive and non-working, what is, what is the particular value of having a machine that works? Um, firstly, the machine, restoring a machine draws you into a level of intimate detail with its technology that is not achievable in any other way. Well, that isn't achieved. In principle, you could, but it never, but one never does. And so that has a number of spin off values that a level of technical detail that the demands of restoration actually um, oblige you to do. So, first is the issue of documentary completeness. Um, and a very good example of this is Elliot 401, which was uh, another machine that the CTS undertook originally in the old canteen to restore. It's currently in the White House. Um, in, in temporary suspension while we get the working bodies go again after the health and safety pilots to have their say. Um, now, th there was a situation where there was a hard drive that was part of this machine with no documentation. The content was not known and there was no metadata. 
and this was the machine we wish to restore. Because if Derek would actually bring this machine to cover, this was Tony and Chris. And you're talking about very high levels of expertise, made the read heads, made the instrumentation to read the bit stream off the hard drive, fed it to the PC, analyzed its structure, and reestablished the data and the metadata. Um, uh, sorry, that was an example I wish to but there's an example of where technical knowledge arises from the attempt to restore, which moves on the <coughs> object. So even if nothing further happened, there is value in that exercise for the machine The example I had in mind in the first was the 401, because that was an early one, 401. The 401, when, when it was taken to Blind House to restore, the working party found that the documentation, the wiring diagrams, did not correspond to the object they had. And anyone in the industry knows how this can happen. Their modifications have done that are not documented. There's versioning problems to be what, what version of documentation you have with which one with the artifact. And so um, even if that machine ultimately doesn't run, and of course we hope it does, um, there is a situation where, um, so what was happening is that the wiring diagrams were correct by doing point-to-point -point, uh, uh, tracking of the wiring to actually establish that the documentation did conform to the artifact. Now that, that, just in historical terms, that is a valuable exercise in itself. So these are kind of spin-offs from the original thing of being drawn into a level of intimate detail of the machine by the requirement to get it to work. There is issue of verification, assuming the documentation does conform to the object. It eliminates any doubt that this might be the case. So there's an issue of verification using Pegasus wiring diagram, circuit and systems diagram on that machine actually creates high degrees of confidence with which we can assert this is a fair documentary reflection, an accurate documentary reflection on that machine. There is a very simple archival benefit. When you start restoring the machine, you start gathering documentation. So one is this, the, 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 the collection of the documentation in one place. It may be dispersed, it may be in various places. The other thing is that you're co-locating it, you're putting it in one place. And this in itself is valuable in an archival sense. The public visibility of these projects also sometimes attracts sources that were unknown at the time or unknown to the museum. So people will identify themselves, I've got XYZ, I've got this routine, I've got that routine. And so the public display, the visibility of the project, the profile of the project in the public mind actually has benefits too in terms of archiving, um, finding new sources and um, historical benefits. There are curious issues more to do with reconstruction than restoration, but I believe it still applies, and that is a recovered memory. When practitioners and pioneers are confronted with an object they have not seen for decades, it unlocks in their minds detail that they've forgotten they knew. And in the case of the reconstructions, this is a particular instance, and I believe it's the case too for restoration. So the fact that the physical artifact is there, if you like it, as a monument to earlier practice, triggers, unlocks memory. And that, again, is valuable um, historical evidence. There is the issue of electronic archaeology, which is what I mentioned the 401, the recovery of the data and the metadata from the hard disk of the 401. There is issues of digital curation, which is an increasing preoccupation with the fears that less will be known of our information age because it's data is stored in the media than is known of Egyptian times, which is stored in information Cyrus or Clay. Um, and uh, the Elliot 801, which is another machine, the early machine um, that the CCS uh, restored to John Sinclair, who was chairman of that working party in the old canteen. Um, and um, there, there were tapes that had been stored in a garage in their camp, magnetic tapes, 35 mil magnetic tapes that were stored in a garage for decades and uh, were readable. And this is a valuable piece of information because a uh, uh, manufacturer of magnetic media will not guarantee the media for longer than about three years. We found that these tapes were readable, or John Sinclair and the working party found these tapes were readable 40 years later, 30, 40 years later. Now, uh, so this actually is, is an encouragement uh, as, a best, uh, as a best case, um, as a best case scenario for magnetic media where there are fears about longevity. So yeah, these tapes were read, they're able to detect. Um, so there are contingent findings in these restorations that are value to other areas of, um, of historical Archive. There is tacit knowledge um, that is acquired from operating machine and is not recordable in any document of any account. Or what it, we know, we learn what it feels like to work this machine. When witnessing a machine being demonstrated, we learn what it is like for people to operate. And this, this, if you like, percolates into consciousness. It informs other decisions. There is tacit knowledge which should not be underestimated. 
Um, running and maintaining systems, uh, researching the circuit detail and so on, offers insight into contemporary practice and ideas. You have an intimate knowledge of what was attempted, whether it was successful um, in, um, in earlier times. And this is a value in itself. It's, the world did not start this morning. There is a history. And these exercises are valuable because history is valuable. History is important. Um, you've seen a most spectacular and really fine example of a simulation, a mid-level simulation of Pegasus. Um, now, ultimately, um, Pegasus and the other machines ultimately form 1,500 archaeological type, but it's unlikely they will still be running uh, without compromising the physical fabric of the machine um, beyond any acceptable level. So, why we, if you like, in archaeological terms, briefly flare this thing back into life, even if that's 1,500 years, um, it provides, the physical working machine provides a marvelous way of benchmarking uh, the simulation. You can compare the simulation directly with the live machine alongside. And there was a time when the, the, the Pegasus simulator was running alongside the machine in the gallery. Um, and so that, that um, I mean, Chris is a terribly modest guy, but that simulation is a, is a massive accomplishment in terms of representing ways in which machines can be preserved. If Turing was right at all, the actual physical implementation of the machine in a particular generation of technologies is irrelevant. It's an accident of the time. That the machine is defined by the, by the logical rules of its operation. And you have a simulation, you have the possibility of migrating from platform to platform. And actually, you, you, you're preserving the machine by preserving the, the rules of its operation. And in fact, because museum culture seems to rely so heavily on permanence of substance, that is to say, objects decay at a very slow rate, and so they have the illusion of permanence in relation certainly to the life, our own life expectancies. There is the idea that somehow things are permanent, and that software is impermanent, is ephemeral. Where in fact, there are pieces of software written in the 50s that are still running on five generations of hardware later, so you can invert the whole thing and say the non material thing is actually what is permanent. And it's actually, this thing's just shedding platforms as it goes. And we try to inverse the, the whole, uh, the, the, the article of faith of museums, which is based on permanence of substance. Um, so, um, simulation, actually, and that is a fine example. The fact it can be done, and has been done in this way. Um, you can interrogate the simulation and get answers about Pegasus that you could address ultimately to the, that you could have addressed to the original machine. So the simulation then, in operational terms, if you like, becomes um, a, a piece of evidentiary source. And it's a virtual object which you can interrogate for, for physical and its operational predicates in the ways that you can otherwise only interrogate the original body fact. And this is a, 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 a really fascinating, um, uh, um, this has fascinating prospects. And it's only because there is a working um, a simulation of that detail and with that, um, completeness and authority that we begin to speculate realistically of simulation really being the salvation of computer preservation. We've spoken a bit about um, historical utility. So those are the kinds of things as to why, how would we justify doing this? What are the benefits, some of them foreseen, some of them unforeseen, about um, what are the benefits to history of actually having a working rather than a non-working machine? There's another dimension to the, 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 the historical utility, the, the, the utility of, um, of restoration, that is the social utility of the machine. These projects, if you like social capital, well, they don't like the world because the mix is something we care about, or something we don't care about. We care about stuff and things and other people seem to care about money. Um, so social capital is a rather uh, conflict of values. Um, it's like corruption, something pure by the markets, but I, I, I'm aware that I'm possibly alone, at least in the minority, think of this. Uh, the point about it is these projects create professional readers or pioneers and practitioners to practice and share their knowledge. And that has used social value. And that was part of the original motivation of founding the society, of reason proposing that you actually create a computer profession. I was a curator, and typically on a, on a Wednesday, I get a call from some desperate person in the middle of nowhere saying, I've worked on this machine for 25 years. They need the space. They're scrapping it on Friday. Can you help? And I get into a car and go driving in the middle of nowhere. And there's a guy working alone with a complete building full of equipment. And he, couldn't, he, you know, he develops attachment. People develop attachment to the machines. They develop a sense and a feel to these things. And um, he would ask, you know, was the museum interested in acquiring it? 
As I believe, there are instances where they tug on my arm and say, can I visit it in store? You know, as though it's visiting an elderly relative. Um, if ever you want to put it on display, come to me, I'll write a routine for it. And this didn't happen once. And that was part of the thing saying, yeah, these people isolated. I mean, metaphorically and literally, they were in the country. They were out there. There were these people isolated, isolated out there with this huge expertise, with huge enthusiasm, with massive knowledge and experience, who had no knowledge of each other. And part of the original motivation, actually, was to say, well, where is the social organizational umbrella that will bring these people together to share um, a, a, a joint enterprise? So um, th there is social capital in the activity of these restorations through the society. Through the society. Um, historic computing machines are cultural objects. Um, they memorialize by the existence and display of contemporary practice and values. And this has a uh, social value. They, the physical artifacts and their monumental size uh, conveys to, to future generations that there was something important, there was something valuable, something of interest there. So these, if you like, are monuments to, to um, milestones. Now, they may not be technological milestones. If you like, what's exceptional about Pegasus, that was a very good example of something typical of its time. You have that paradox or specialist that it's typical. And uh, well, what's typical about it is that it, it, it was. It, was out there producing real work um, in a day-to-day -day way and that people can now um, witness this and somehow sample something if you like several generations the generation is 20 years we're talking about two to three generations of generational bridges in people being able to experience and appreciate uh, these machines they have both um, uh, they have both uh, display value they also have educational value it is a surprise for people brought up in the modern age that a bike wasn't always a bits, and that you can have words that are non-integral multiples of, um, of eight or four or two. Uh, and this actually um, is a valuable experience for people to attend. That there is a past, it wasn't always the way it is. And I think that's one of the most valuable lessons of histories and museums. It wasn't always this way. And just by being confronted with an artifact, there's the uh, pilot ace down on the ground floor of the computer museum. And we took a group of school kids and said, what do you think this thing is? And if you know, it's got telephone switches and that's a wooden thing. And they said they thought it was um, a telephone exchange. Um, so it's very interesting to say, you know, this is a computer, because that mismatch, the defamiliarization of what your expectations are, is actually a huge, a huge education value. So these things are cultural artifacts. They are monuments to, to the past. and. Um, they um, are hugely valuable to have there as uh, reminders that um, things always things always weren't the way they are now. Um, viewing them stimulates new questions, new lines of inquiry, and um, as I mentioned, they act as generational bridges. And finally, in the most trivial way, museums and every, every main museum I can tell you that having working machines enhances visit, visit experience, and that's not a bad thing. It's an exciting thing, interacting particularly with practitioners and people who have lived. Um, these are first generation, Len, Chris, Tony, these are first generation um, practitioners, pioneers, um, and computer professionals. And it's uh, fantastic that the public can have access to these people live on gallery and uh, converse with them. Because the tacit knowledge that comes from that, quite apart from technical knowledge, is a massive and inestimable value. Um, I've spoken about the utility and the benefits um, as though there's no downside. And it's actually quite difficult to find a downside. The biggest downside, I would say, is the question, the, 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 the age-old issue of authenticity, and that is that through running a machine, wear and tear, possible disaster, you're compromising the physical integrity of the machine. And this is the biggest ideological opposition to restoration of this kind. And when I talk about protocols and working practices, it's not one set of rules that says you can't do this, you can't do that. It's to do with imbuing one with the principle that of the object as evidentiary source, that anything that compromises the physical predicates of the machine that may mislead someone in the future asking questions we cannot foresee, then a judgment needs to be made. For instance, the IBM 1604 in um, America, uh, they want to restore this. Uh, the memory was unretrievable. It was a, it was a, it was a mechanical core store memory. It was unretrievable. It was un, uh, I mean, it was there, but it, was, uh, it could not be restored. And the question is, do you take that memory out and replace it with a solid state memory and get an operational machine? Is history better served by having an operational machine with a non-original memory or to leave the thing intact in a passive way? 
Now, in that case, you could replace a physical memory in the same physical space without disrupting the wiring connectors or backwiring or anything else. And, but a judgment had to be made. If it was the case that you could not do that, that you would have to alter the physical fabric of the machine, that you would have to alter it in a non-reversible way, then the, the, the decision may go the other way. So really, uh, what, what Chris referred to as inculcating, indoctrinating, uh, it's really to do with, with imbuing people with the principle of why it is conservationists have the preservation practices they have, so that people can make informed judgment about what is tolerable and permissible intervention in any given restoration. And I think that the, the, the uh, activities of the, uh, the working parties, that's the 803 working party, or one working party, all the ones who are going on flesh and farm, um, I think it really is a success story in terms of the group that was originally assembled in the other canteen disseminating these values um, so that with confidence uh, these projects can be undertaken without compromising the custodial responsibilities of, of the curator in the museum. Thanks very much.
things are restored, textiles are restored. And I wonder what you think about working museums in the sort of Kreitsch, um, the Mountain Railway Museum, and Shuttleworth Collection. I mean, that sort of, to some extent, argues against your point of view, is it not? But saying that, that regular intervention is, is okay. And, well, and sanctioned by the machines to be used because they feel like it's a feeling for what the world was like in those days. Um, I attended a, a conference in Holland and they had a debate where two museum people were asked to argue the two opposite views. Right. That you best honour the object by allowing people to experience how it works. And the opposite view, which is the conservation of the logical view, which says uh, this is now an object of record and not the object. I was entirely convinced by both arguments. Can I ask Mr. Sway how we use the advantage machine in terms of the explanation we've given? After all, you've supervised the construction of the museum. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting one, because the baggage machine is not original, so the, there, there's no original baggage machine. So this is, um, if you like, um, a modern artifact. Uh, the way I've around that, one is, so it's a, working, it's a working research object, all intervention is possible. In fact, the most radical intervention was constructed in the first place. The way I've got around that, and the records will show, that that project started in 1986. The, the, the machine wasn't finished until 2002. It wasn't inventory until it was finished. And therefore, it was not subject. Six years, there are many rebuilds. Lots of bomb, maybe. They are they are rebuilds. They're modern machines. But what if you might go a new party in a hundred years' time? <laughs> 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 Just a general question, um, to what extent uh, were Pegasus, if that's a plural, um, uh, moved round? I mean, we, we actually had a ball one from Southampton University, so there was probably a sort of two elements, you know. Um, did did Pegasus generally sort of, you know, give them to one another and that was it at the end? They were maintained. I don't Um, how we reconcile it is, is um, 
And firstly, to challenge the reasons for them doing it, um, in, in, insofar as one can, um, and then um, comply gracefully and minimize what damage one can. Um, it was a piece of pure trickery that we actually managed to get to the machine. The conservators wanted to break the machine down and put it in, 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 in deep store fixes. Uh, and the reason for that was to protect the machine, of course. Um, uh, we knew uh, that if the machine was not run for a whole year, uh, it was questionable that it would run again. So it was imperative that while it was on hold and right out, that the machine was run. Um, now, the argument used by the conservators not to run the machine was that because it was a temporary thing, we couldn't go to the expense of actually installing refrigeration and cooling for it to operate. So it was a piece of pure trickery, because what I said to them then was, is it the case, I understand your concern, and we did be touched by your concern for this artifact, but is it the case that if it didn't need refrigeration, um, you'd be willing to run it? Oh, yes, 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 they said. I said, well, actually, this original the machine was originally designed to run without refrigeration, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my answer to how you deal with administration is, um, firstly, not to assume, well, they have authority, but not to assume that the authority is well found, and the motives are always um, uh, uh, aligned with our aspirations. And all I can do is to try and minimize the physical disruption to the machine. Um, uh, but <clears throat> It's to do with the institutional politics and sort of the, 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 the comments I made about health and safety were that um, those were glory days. And the period we mentioned about it moving to rights, the point at which conservators rather than curators became responsible for the, for the physical artifacts. And that move, because most conservators are trained in archaeological models, not industrial artifacts, which are very, very different, is uh, there, there, so uh, it really is uh, to reconcile the values of, of archaeological conservation with the curatorial idea of the utility of an industrial artifact. And I think the best one can do is to, to not be facetious about it, is really to try and educate them. And say, this is an industrial artifact, it is a live thing. Um, and without compromising your archaeological and conservationist protocols, um, there is intervention which is permissible and tolerable. So I think it's education is the answer, to try and reconcile those sets of values. So we've said a lot about the hardware aspects, but you've also brought out that the, the restoration project has accounts the, the simulator and the preservation of a lot of the digital material. In fact, behind Pegasus, there is a large body of software. There's an extensive subroutine library, and that's built it. You probably wouldn't realize it. It's all these drawers that Chris has. And that, there's a body of digital material that's been Preserve, and that then we should be thinking about how do you make that accessible and uh, used to support the, the ongoing exhibit? Yes, I think the answer is, is systems that we don't separate hardware and software. We're saying what you're preserving is a system, yes. and the software is indispensable for the system. The system is incomplete without the software, and everything that's been said about hardware preservation through the simulation is extended to the software. And, and so um, uh, I, I think it's a false distinction. Uh, I mean, it's an understandable one, a very deep root one. It's very difficult actually to, to separate that thinking mainly because the way the profession is, 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 is structured. But um, I'd say that what, what, what curators and museums are doing are preserving systems um, for which there are, um, you know, so I'd say all the preservation criteria and benefits extend to, to, to the software too. Uh, I think you come back to software because there's a difference between the software and the writing programs for modern machines which have real band of access storage and writing programs for machines that have serial storage and how do you sort of preserve that mindset other than through examples of software? This way you to use the simulator and learn to do it. I agree that uh, of course um, principles and practice you definitely practice first round in the UK and we don't know what people in Victorian times, for example, uh, thought about steam engines in the same way that we do today. So uh, it can be a loss, but the simulator, of course, is the nearest we can get to preserving that. Thank you, Michael Ross. Three points that might be of interest. About five years ago, I started to inquire into the original history of the Science Museum computer. And I was able to track down the men who worked on it very near the beginning of its portability. 
there are the engineers of Bracknell, in the front laboratories of Bracknell, and those who worked on the machine when it went over to Sweden in the Scandinavia, the Scandia Insurance Company. And I was able to get first-hand information from them of what was being done on this computer. And I got photographs of it and all that kind of thing. And I produced a report on this, a copy of which is in the Science Museum, if you can find it. And another copy is in the archive of the, what we all call the Institution of Electrical Engineers. It's changed its title to something stupid now. <laughs> but, uh, right, those two copies do exist. And they fill in the first few years, two or three years, of the life of the Science Museum computer. Now the other two points I think have not been very much noticed in the literature. The first concerns this the circuits which were developed by Charles Owen. Because he was interested in Bill Elliott was interested in this computer, Pegasus computer, being commercially viable. Charles Owen used fermionic valves, triodes. The great majority of valves in Pegasus are triodes. I worked on these, of course, in those days. And they were essentially designed for audio frequencies. That is up to 20,000 uh, hertz. But for using a computer, they, they have to be able to cope with something like square waves. Square waves require, whereas the audio work is on sinusoidal. Their waves require high, substantial harmonics, third, fifth, and seventh harmonics, so that it was a considerable <coughs> achievement by Owen to be able to adapt these triode valves to work with the uh, rectangular uh, pulse waveforms, which are essentially in a digital machine. I don't think he's been given credit for doing that aspect of the work yet. Now, in Pegasus, the waveforms are substantially non-rectangular. Uh, you've seen one or two pictures already. But what Owen did to make it work properly was that he strode each pulse <coughs> with a signal from the magnetic drum. And uh, this meant that he was able to chop out the center of an all bad waveform. Now this leads to the third point I want to mention, which is the magnetic drums. They were developed mechanically by Brian Maudsley, and as far as we know, the drum on the museum computer is it, still working in its original form. Brian Maudsley looked after the mechanical design of the drum, and it's still running up after 50 years. I know some of the time has been waiting in storage, but at any rate, the bearings in that drum are still viable. But the, the other aspect of it is the, ma the magnetic aspect, which was developed by Ian Mary. And I've made inquiries of the, con the uh, engineers working on the drum at present. And I understand 
but that magnetic drum has never been re-recorded. Now this means that this machine, 50 years old, is running on magnetic recordings which were put on the drum 50 years ago. And I think it's very remarkable that they still work, they still function properly. It's also very remarkable that in no time in those 50 years, anybody has got the drum and managed to do to make groove in it by misplacing the, the heads. I thought I'd mention those three points.